Ready to roll? All right, thanks. Um, thanks, oh, originally goes to Ben and Janice for the invite um, to the Riverfest and um, it's good to be here. So hopefully there's some new ears I can burn, uh, talk off, sorry, uh, talk to, uh, let's say. Um, at the moment, I'm currently acting Pro Vice Chancellor Indigenous at the University of Canberra. So my uh, time has been cut to do anything <laughs> in the water space. Um, this presentation, I'll talk about a lot of my experiences and hopefully some ways forward and, and also some, some resources to consider um, into the future. So I might get into it, eh? Um, actually quite, quite ironic, Steve project talking about uh, dams, you know, here in Australia in the southeast, you know, the, we've got governments pushing the the um, the the building of dams and culture will def cultural renewal and culture would be definitely last on the list. Um, yeah, you got to look at the raising of the dam at Warragamba and also the, the the building of a couple of new dams in New South Wales. So you know, where we're, we're Indigenous people are well down the list, um, let alone project leading the removal. Um, first of all, I've got to identify who I am and where I'm from and obviously acknowledge country. I'm on Ngunnawal country in Canberra and uh, thank them for allowing me to be here. And I'm a Camilleroy man, Northwest New South Wales. You can sort of see the map there. We've got a fair chunk of the state. Now uh, we go up into Queensland. And obviously this is why I do what I do, those old photos and obviously the generations to come. So the past, the present, and obviously the ones to come. Um, hopefully my kids can uh, take a lead in this space. Um, so let's give you an idea of what Australia is. You know, we, we only respond to a crisis. You know, so we had the thousand kilometers of blue-green algal blooms in um, the Murray-Darling, and then we got the National Water Initiative. You know, we had the mega drought, and that followed straight after the millennium drought. Is that the, is that the normal? I don't think so. So things are changing. You know, we've got species extinction, and we've got the review of the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, and Indigenous voices are relatively missing from that as well. We've got coral bleaching, um, and some people say what bleaching? We've got millions of dead fish at the, the end of last summer um, and you know we had the na native fish recovery strategy which was a, a way forward but really that was chump change um, thrown at that um, and unfortunately those dead fish are long gone now and you know a lot of those those fish are culturally significant and that sort of aspect wasn't really considered as well so um, dead fish are going to keep coming um, we're going to have rivers drying up again unless we change the way we do business. And then obviously we had the devastating fires and out of that we got those acronyms and they were around the recovery but also funding sources for, for dealing with um, um, the fire impact. So unfortunately the, the drought um, was soon forgotten about because of the devastating fires and then obviously we got COVID which soon made us forget about the fires and the drought. So my point is, when will Australia give over? Give us a go. And Victor Stephenson is a cultural fire practitioner um, and he was on ABC Australian Story in, um, in April and, you know, give Aboriginal people a go. Um, 200 odd years of, of destruction and mayhem. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a time to, that we, 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 we give us a go. Um, this is my meme from Facebook, day one in the colony. Um, you know, so I think that's, that's, that's quite pertinent. You know, they, they're asking knowledge back then, um, where water sources were, food sources. They were watching Aboriginal people as, as the colonizers rolled in. And, um, you know, they took that knowledge and used it and abused it, unfortunately. So we, um, we're in the state we're in now. So culture for me is who I am, my family, kin, respect, um, listening more than talking. That's why you've got two ears and one mouth. You've got to do double the listening. Um, all, I'm always learning and passing on culture. That's that traditional knowledge aspect. Language is a key part. Our connection to country is integral to, to who we are. And obviously, then we move into the, 
our cultural water places and also cultural water species. So these are just a couple of my species, the um, Malian, uh, wedge-tailed eagle, the apex predator at the top of the tree. And um, if I ever go into witness protection, I will be called Aquila audax. Don't tell anyone though. Um, Brolga is a very important species as this is this photo I took a number of years ago in the Guaida wetlands in northwestern New South Wales on my country. And um, we, um, you yeah, know, those birds are very important. You know, they're migratory, they're internationally significant, and obviously they're very culturally significant to, to Aboriginal people. The Brolga dance is, is very cool. You know, you can Google it and watch it. And a lot of Indigenous people actually mimic its dance in their, in their, in their songs and as well as their dancing. So, you know, these species are in our, in our water places, around our water places, that's a good sign. Something to consider when you look at that map from Robert Zooks on grasshopper geography, where he's digitised all the water places around Australia, you know, ephemeral, desert, um, the wet, you know, you've got the, in the north, the, the wet and dry season, you know, they're wet in the wet season, obviously, and then they dry up towards the end of the dry season. So, you know, you've got the, the Murray-Darling Basin to the southeast, and you can sort of see the Lake Eyre Basin, you know, a large inland desert basin. And obviously the Murray-Darling Basin, as I mentioned there, and the sort of the aqua bottom right. You know, they look like the, the lungs of, the, of Australia. Um, but really, when you think about that, once you move away from the east coast, the north, you know, the coastal systems and the southeast of surface, you know, a lot of surface water, you really have to know where water is. And I think that knowledge is not celebrated in the Australian context, let alone um, taught in our curricula. Um, and I think it's something that we, we need to have a good, good look at. You know, I think that knowledge can value add to the way we manage our country. So water, cultural value of water, it's protected by law. It's in the songs, dance and dreaming, stories and art. Um, for me, it's water knowledge is crucial and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, it's how our old people knew, knew water and how we know water today. Tell our science and stories our way find and refine water in a dry landscape, that's the celebrate, celebratory bit we don't do. Um, and we don't value and protect that water based on cultural values or traditional knowledge. And then obviously I'm keen to, through my research role here in, at UC is to validate the knowledge for you know, my people. Um, and I can't represent all Indigenous Australia. I only do for Camilleroy people and that's it. So where is our water voice? So we are the driest inhabited continent on earth, and one of the oldest surviving cultures on the planet, but we have no water voice. This is water 101 in the Australian context. We're always being impacted by decisions that ex exclude us. We're the only modern con colonized country without a treaty with its first peoples. Um, we're always an afterthought or out of scope and beyond, you know, what happens beyond the welcome or the reconciliation action plan. You know, it's, I've been on a number of national committees and, and you sort of see these big multi-million dollar research projects and indigenous people just aren't there. So I suppose when you think about the New Zealand context, you know, the Maoris have a treaty and, you know, they have the opportunities to, to be at the front. Um, and, you know, they, the, the treaty allows for that. Whereas in the Australian context, we are an afterthought. And, and potentially when we raise the issue, uh, we're always out of scope and it costs too much money to do it. So we, we're always being left out. I suppose the reviews that happen all the time, like the Productivity Commission's review and all the old biennial, triennial assessments by the National Water Commission, you know, I got tired of hearing what we don't have. We know what we don't have, we've got nothing. And I suppose that's, that's the challenge is that we need to keep banging the table and banging on doors to make sure that we're, we're heard. Another big one is we're never seen as experts, only as, story, only as storytellers of myth and legend. Um, and I suppose that's the, the aspect of, of what has happened in this country is that, you know, it's, it's, it's turned that traditional knowledge, thousands of generations of observation and testing the environment and getting the best out of environment in a sustainable way has been turned into myth and legend. So it removes it from the into a fiction um, of, you know, mumbo jumbo. Um, so it's, it's sort of that bit of traditional knowledge is not celebrated at all. There's more, more here, sorry, more bad news. 
the non-Aboriginal voices telling our stories, there's no disrespect there, but I suppose it's, it's also up to us to enter, enter the space and tell our stories our way. Um, you know, the fish kills in the Murray, you know, in the Murray, or the Lower Darling, or the Lower Darling um, end of 1920, in the start of 20, you know, we, we saw two independent scientific panels and not one Indigenous person was seen as an expert for that. You know, we had the government through MDBA create one and obviously the Academy of Science created one as well. They said a lot of the same things, which was lucky for them, um, the, the two independent reviews, but Indigenous people weren't seen as experts to be part of that. We're always at the back of reports, policy, plans and legislations. You know, we've, we've seen the, the bit where we're, we're in up the front with an acknowledgement, which is great. That's a good start, but then we don't see anything positive until the end. Um, and I suppose, you know, there's plenty of examples out there where, you know, there might be acknowledgement up front. Yeah, we acknowledge Indigenous people, whatever country we're on, and that's it. So I suppose that, that bit happens. There's no national strategy at the moment for science, water, fire. We don't have a centre of excellence. Um, and I suppose that's the thing that, you know, we, we need to fill that space as well and, you know, push push research and academia and, and the academies, you know, to start thinking differently about how we, we, we consider traditional knowledge in, in the aspect of managing country. So, and the other problem is that governments, whether that's local, state or federal, they're always deleting our programs. I'll talk about one I was involved with in New South Wales, you know, there's, there's, a, there's always a good idea um, to do something and then all of a sudden um, you start getting progress, building trust and respect and outputs and then all of a sudden it's, it's canned. Um, this is the New South Wales one, you know, 2012, the Aboriginal Water Initiative was created. Um, it was the then only Aboriginal water in Australia. There was a team of Aboriginal water professionals um, that had to learn the language of water. And in New South Wales, you know, we still had the old Water Act and then obviously the Water Management Act come in which was repealing the old water management act so the the water act and you know that these guys had to learn water um i was lucky to a point as you know i've been in the water space for a number of years i've been in the water space let's say sixty thousand years so i know a bit about it um i was actually honored to lead that team for nearly five years you know we had great gave cultural competency to the agency we had input to policy guidance, build education products. We had influence. We trained um, the department, but also the team as well. There was integrity and capacity being built. And that's the thing that, um, and then obviously um, what we're trying to do is collect cultural values and protect them through water, water resource plans and water management plans and around those, those values and those depend, water dependent cultural values were being protected um, until a change management struck. And that's the one where, you know, a new leadership comes in, deletes everything. Um, we can't even find anything on our website anymore after five years of, of the process. So it's, um, that bit's got to change as well. Um, this is a, an aspect that also needs to be considered when engaging Indigenous people. So we're all, we're all different, and you know, sometimes that is a challenge for, for agencies and, and consultancies and things like that. You know, there's a lot of different mobs out there. Um, and, you know, they all have different language and law and landscapes um, and management areas, cultural practice, capacity, status and governance. Governance is one of the things, you know, like there's a lot of our elders are the key people everyone wants to talk to. And then obviously there's a, um, we call it the, well, in the desert part, it's the, the Land Cruiser convoy. And in the cities, it's the Camry convoy um, of all the, all the government vehicles waiting to, to lining up to talk to them. So I suppose it's, it's a challenge. And that, that aspect of capacity is another thing as well that needs to be considered. So current commitments, some of the positives. Uh, we had the National Cultural Flows Research Program produce its findings in 2018. So there's a, a plenty of, opportunities there, you know, we've got Murray, Lower Darling Rivers Indigenous Nations, Mildren is the acronym, and also the Northern Basin Aboriginal Nations, which were established by the Murray Darling Basin Authority to give advice on water resource planning in the basin. You know, they, uh, they, they teamed up with um, NAILSMA, another big acronym, um, and National Native Title Council. So, you know, they produced the research where they actually tested um, 
uh, watering of two places. One was modelled because there wasn't flows there and the other one was actually physically watered and that's on the, the, the Nari Nari country in, in Hay uh, on the Murrumbidgee and the other one was um, in northwest New South Wales on the Colgoa. So Victoria is doing some cool things, you know, the treaty, they're talking, they're talking about that um, aspect. Aboriginal Water Program committed 9.7 million. Um, I gave them a lot of uh, New South Wales resources at the time. Um, and then obviously the, the Yarra River Protection Act with the Wurundjeri um, is, a, is a fantastic outcome, giving the, the river a right to be a river. And I think the, um, the Wurundjeri doing some cool stuff down there. Northern Territory actually legislated strategic Aboriginal reserves. Uh, it was off the table as strategic Indigenous reserves, and then it was back on the table once a new new government come in. So I suppose we you know be watching closely what's ha what happens to those. And um, also I should add that you know in the in the Fitzroy the in WA in Western Australia, um, you know that that river is under threat from from a lot of these uh, Murray Darling refugees. Let's call them moving to the northwest. Um, to, to, to look at um, accessing that sort of country. And, you know, there's strong cultural components out there. And, um, you know, they're, they're, the Marawara, I think they call it the, the Fitzroy River, you know, they're, they're trying very hard to protect that. And they have a Marawara declaration and those people want to be part of it. So there's also other mobs talking treaty as well. You know, Victoria, as I mentioned, Northern Territory, Queensland and WA. And I suppose the federally have sort of palmed it off and they've sort of said that it's a state issue um, uh, put it back to all the, the little colonies. Um, and hopefully water is a key part of that, um, those treaty discussions. These are just some new resources out there for people. Um, so the Australasian Journal of Environmental Management, there was an Indigenous Water Management Special Edition. Uh, I got to co-edit that with Professor Sue Jackson. Jackson. And, um, you know, it was Indigenous co-led and also Indigenous authors. Um, there was the New South Wales case study, which I prepared. Aboriginal waterways assessments, um, Snowy River uh, environmental watering project. That and GD values down at the mouth in South Australia, the Fitzroy River. Uh, environmental water in Indigenous partnerships on, on you know, it's the positives out of that. And, you know, the, the Fitzroy River uh, article was written in, in language. So, you know, that might be a first for uh, Australian um, environmental or water resource journals. So yeah, that's out there. And I suppose that's us filling the space. And so still to come, we've got the Australasian Journal of Water Resources, a special edition also, which is Australian New Zealand papers. And then I believe soon um, there'll be River as a first author. Uh, coming out in a paper soon. So, you know, that that's really exciting time to... Hi, Brad. Coming. It's Jess. Uh, can I just give you a, a couple of minute um, countdown, if that's okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm nearly done. Thanks, mate. Um, these are a couple of resources. Um, yeah, the old ANZAC guidelines. So now there's cultural and spiritual values guidance. Um, and uh, they'll, they'll release in 2018. And then there's obviously Indigenous Principles for Water Quality, which were done by myself and Roku Mihinui from Te Arawa in New Zealand. And um, they are resources there for water quality management. So there's, there's no excuse now in water quality. Um, these are my demands. Uh, no, no, sorry. This is my aspirations, let's say. Um, I think we need Aboriginal water units in each state and territory, you know, let's look at river ranges, National First Peoples Water Council, well, we don't have an advisory body for that. Uh, we don't have a centre of excellence. And obviously water research led, you know, putting that cultural science into, into academia. We don't have a, we need a National First Peoples Water Strategy. And then obviously the ultimate dream would be a National First Peoples Water Holder. That's me taking water selfies around the place. That'll do me. Thanks. Thanks, Brad.